This is a mission system. What do you know? Um, what do you know about emissions? Uh, and some of you guys are going to know these answers, some aren't. Vehicles primarily produce three harmful gases and two harmless slash beneficial gases. What are the harmful three? Uh, carbon monoxide. Uh -huh. What's it, NOx? That's that's two good ones, yeah. Yeah, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, and oxides of nitrogen. Hydrocarbons. Yep, hydrocarbons is unburned fuel. Okay, watch this. Uh, we got hydrocarbons going in. We got air going in. Now nitrogen only is. We actually got oxygen and nitrogen. Now, you guys know. How um, and so the oxygen and nitrogen aren't bound together; they're just kind of mixed out here. Yep. Okay, so you got this oxygen and nitrogen. How much oxygen we got? Twenty-one percent. And nitrogen, seventy-eight percent, and trace elements, right? Okay, there's trace elements for that other one percent. So basically, your oxygen and nitrogen is coming into the mix. And hydrocarbon, whenever the spark happens, it actually causes uh, every hydrocarbon molecule, if it's uh, molecule, wants to get married to two. <coughs> oxygen molecules and that's why you got CO2. Uh, if the mixture is a little rich you'll only have CO and that's carbon monoxide and that's bad news. Yeah. If you've got nitrogen and oxygen if the temperature in the combustion chamber goes above 2500 then it's going to cause oxygen and nitrogen to lock together in various different nitrogen compounds and that's why you call it NOx because that X can be just about any number. You know various different and so your catalytic converter is basically going to take that and it's going to add a molecule of oxygen to carbon monoxide and make it carbon dioxide. It's going to add two molecules of oxygen to hydrocarbons and make it carbon um, dioxide. And it's going to break apart your oxides of nitrogen into oxygen and nitrogen so that everything that's coming out is what we want, which are the harmless slash beneficial gases, which is CO2 and water vapor. You got me? We breathe out CO2, our cars breathe out CO2. Nothing wrong with that. Um, so basically, CO2 and water vapor are the harmless beneficial gases. Hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and oxides of nitrogen, which is NOx, is the ones that are harmful. So make sure you put that down right. What gas does the exhaust gas recirculation system control? Exhaust gas recirculation. EGR is controlling what? I'd say the exhaust gas. All right. No, well, <laughs> it's actually controlling NOx. Now, the way it controls NOx, it controls NOx by cooling the combustion chamber a little. See, this is actually going into your into your combustion chamber. Uh, see, I'm actually going into each cylinder. I'm just going to draw one with two cylinders here. Okay, now usually you're going to have a throttle plate, and right behind that throttle plate, you're going to have your EGR, and your EGR is going to be able to it's got a diaphragm on it usually. And it's going to be able to raise a little pedal. There's a coming from the exhaust manifold, which we're going to put down here, it'll usually have a pipe coming up. And that pipe is coming up to this valve, and that valve opens up, and it lets that pipe is long and so that it can get uh, cool that exhaust gas off a little bit on the way. Now, on these diesels, it's got EGR coolers. It cools it a lot. It cools it like 800 degrees before it goes in there on a diesel. But on this thing right here, uh, this is going to go behind that and go up here and it's going to let that. You just replaced your EGR valve. And, and you remember that long skinny metal pipe? That's what that is. It was, it, it's annoying because she couldn't get the bolt broke loose and had to get the pipe and everything from the salvage yard. When this goes in though, this EGR is going to be equally fed to all the cylinders. If EGR is flowing at idle, it's going to idle rough. If you flow EGR at idle, you're going to have a rough idle. Now, it's going to rob a little bit of power, but you also get an additional amount of time advance. Hey, Richard? Yes, ma'am. Hey, I'm just saying, 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 I'm just
That battery, that Mercedes has got to have a battery put in it and it takes a long time. So they sold her a battery at advance and we got there wanting to know if we could put a battery in for her. So and that's what we got. Sorry about that in, uh, interruption. Well, that shouldn't really be too large. No, well, it takes a little while on a Mercedes, but any, yeah, yeah, they didn't want to do it at the parts house. So anyway, um, all right. So let's get back on target here. Uh, what's the optimum? Well, that's the exhaust gas recirculation system controls NOx, and it does that. You put some inert gas in there whenever when the burning's going on. And you're not going to have as hot of a fire, right? If you take away, we're on three. The, uh, um, excuse me, two. We've already done that. Excuse me. Three is where we should have been. Yeah. The optimum air fuel mixture for the cleanest burn is 14.7 to one. You know, you it's, you know skitters around on both sides of that on your newest vehicles, but 14.7 to one means 14.7, and we're talking by weight, not volume. If you go by volume, you're burning 9,000 gallons of air for each gallon of gas. Left. That's a lot of air. It is, but you're actually going to have 14.7 uh, but to one by weight. Engineers always measure fuel by weight. You got that? Engineers always measure fuel by weight. And uh, like for instance, the injectors that you find are measured by how many pounds of fuel per hour they can put through. If you look at it, the fuel injectors, they have different colored connectors. You know, like the ones for the Mustang would have an orange connector, and it's a 19 pound per hour injector in the pickups. The ones for the passenger cars would have a, a uh, gray one that would have like 14 pounds per hour. So basically they tailor the size of the little nozzles in the injectors by how much fuel they can do, uh, how many pounds of fuel. And even in aircraft, they don't measure fuel by the gallon in aircraft, they measure it by the pound. You know, or like a, or in the in jets, they measure it by the ton. You know, tons of fuel and all this. Uh, like a MiG-25 fo Fox Bat, when you fill up the tanks, it takes 14 tons of jet fuel, as I read somewhere. <laughs> I thought that was astonishing, you know. Yeah, it is. But uh, they burn a lot, too. Uh, why was it necessary to remove lead from gasoline in the uh, 1970s? No, it actually clogs the catalytic converter. When they started putting catalytic converters on there, uh, they found that the lead would coat the catalyst and clog it, and so they had to go with unleaded gas. What was the lead in there to begin with for? Was it prevented Made the engine last longer. Yeah, Rich, so Basically, whenever you, it would coat the valves and keep them seating good and all that stuff. What? And it was sort of a lubricant, huh? So you're telling me the government stepped in and blocked everything? They did what? They ruined everything? Not really. Uh, te technically, um, if you, if I'll tell you, I'll tell you why they didn't ruin everything. I want to tell you. Me and my wife, we walk in the morning early in the morning and ever so often when we're walking there's an old truck from that era of time that doesn't have a catalytic converter and doesn't have any of the emission controls goes by and when it goes by it burns your eyes and it makes gives you hard trouble if you were a traffic cop in the days when you're standing out here doing this and in amongst the traffic in a big city you'd see a haze a lot of smog over there and your eyes would be burning and all that nowadays you don't see any of that stuff so basically, if you went back to the way things used to be, you'd be ruining everything. So start thinking the right way, right? Okay. You're going to do like Sean Grant and do this right here, you know, really. All right, now then. Yeah. So what vehicle uh, emission does the evaporative system control? Somebody should know the answer to that. Gas vapors. Yeah, gas vapors, which is your hydrocarbons. When you smell gas at the gas pump, when you're pumping gas into the car, you're smelling hydrocarbons. They don't want hydrocarbons getting out of the air, so they completely seal the system up, and the vapor goes and it's stored in the canister, and then ever so often the uh, canister purge valve is a little valve that's between the manifold and the canister, and it goes clickety-clickety-click, and it starts pulling the, uh, the uh, vapors out of that canister, and so on and so forth. How many of you have ever heard about somebody saturating their carbon canister by packing the gas? You pack the gas in there, then you get liquid going through that line. It saturates the canister. Then when the canister starts trying to purge, uh, the vehicle will fall on its face and try to surge ahead. And nowadays, used to, they only they only would purge when you were into the gas. As a matter of fact, they have your purge and your EGR triggered at the same time. And so nowadays, and they'd only have it triggered when the engine was warm because they have a little thermal vacuum switch in there. But nowadays, you can be sitting at a red light somewhere on your vehicle 
and this thing will suddenly start purging now. Uh, Daniel's brother was complaining because he could hear his canister purge valve going tick, 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 making that noise. Oh my, we yell a Jeep if somebody changed the oil and it happened to push it on its little rubber mounts where it was under an air conditioner line, it would start try, you know, purging and it would sound like the engine was knocking. It would be coming through the dash and all that, you know. So anyway, the, they don't all make that noise, but a lot of them do. And uh, I used to have a canister purge solenoid up here, but it's basically a little vacuum solenoid that whenever it's energized, it's open, and when it's not, it's closed, and they'll do a percentage thing. Now, in your little deck of cards that the computer uses to deal out what it needs to for various different operating conditions, those are called cells, and some of those cells are distinctly uh, identified as purge-free cells. In other words, the cell, during that particular mode of operation, and there's, you know it's a complicated map, but during that particular mode of operation, when it's not purging the canister, that is so significant that they call those purge free cells because they know then it doesn't, it, it'll go to a purge free cell when it doesn't need those extra gasoline vapors and they're messing things up and stirring up issues. If they know it's going to purge, it's prepared for that, it looks for it, and it's ready to balance things. Because see, that gasoline vapor is going to go into your mix and it's going to change stuff. Got me? If too much goes in there, you got a problem. Um, like for instance, if you've got one that you know everything else is right, but when it, but every now and then you get black smoke out of it, you need to disable a canister purge system, see if that problem goes away. It can be fuel trim issues or whatever. So that's pretty important stuff. This is an emissions class, and that's what we're talking about mostly. Uh, but it also is sort of it's in, it's in intertwined with engine performance too. Uh, let's see. Uh, Black smoke from the exhaust is a strong indicator of what kind of emissions? Hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons. You're not going to see smoke because of NOx or carbon monoxide. Uh, like I say, a slightly rich mix is going to give you carbon monoxide. A very rich mix is going to give you your black soot and your hydrocarbons. If you've got an injector that's just spraying fuel through there like a fire hose, and then it's basically going to have a mist of gasoline coming out of the exhaust that you can you know, catch on your hand and smell. Uh, the black smoke is basically soot. It's kind of like, if you see me when we light the torch and you basically just have the acetylene coming out, you see all this, that's, that's hydrocarbon smoke coming off of there, you know. All right, uh, let's see. What happens at the molecular level when fuel burns in the combustion chamber? Fuel unites with oxygen and gives off heat. Basically, as it unites with oxygen, uh, it's getting, you know, if you've got your 14.7 to 1 right, you'll have carbon dioxide mostly there. Uh, except when the engine's cold, before it starts paying attention to the oxygen sensor, you're subject to have some hydrocarbons. Uh, does anybody remember the uh, air, the air management system, and how they would pump air into the man exhaust manifold? You see them pipes going into the exhaust manifold. And back in the uh, mid '70s, a lot of people would take all that stuff off around in this part of the country where they don't have emissions testing, and they would just put plugs in those holes. Well, the reason those are there is because whenever the engine's cold, there's a lot of hydrocarbons coming out there that hasn't burned because it runs richer when it's colder, and they shoot some oxygen in there when it's cold, and that adds oxygen to those hydrocarbons and finishes the burn, and then you're getting your carbon monoxide even when the engine's cold, see? Because a cold engine's going to have some random misfires. Your engine controller doesn't even look for misfires during about the first 250 seconds as you start the car because when it's running rich, you're going to have random misfires and stuff. And that's why I'm constantly preaching about don't crank the cars up, let them run 10 seconds or, you know, 30 seconds, pulling them into the stall and shut them off. Uh, Webb had to pull the spark plugs out of that Sonata because they had got so fouled from the little short runs in and out of the shop that the plugs got to where they wouldn't clean themselves off. They were just dead skipping all the time. If you work, Daniel, on the, on the uh, Toyota place, you may get cars from the used car lot that are either skipping or running crummy or or won't start at all because they move it from one place to the other without letting it warm up. And for some reason, you can't seem to get people that through people's head that, that does two things. It sledges the engine up, and another thing it does is it fouls the plugs. You know, you can get it warm enough to where it ain't going to foul the plugs while still sledging up the engine. And I don't know at the times I've gone out to somebody's house when I used to go and do work for people, and they say, my car just wouldn't start, but they hadn't been letting it warm up. And you could pull the plugs, and they were just soaking wet because of the way they'd been driving it. See, it wasn't a problem with the car other than the fact, I mean, it's something they made. It wasn't anything wrong other than they'd foul the plugs by not driving it, you know, letting it warm up. My wife will not start her Explorer unless she lets it warm completely up. I've got her trained about that. She just will not do it. She will not start it up unless she's going to get it warm. 
And that thing is clean as a bell. I mean, clean, cl uh, clear and clean on the inside. Okay, um, let's see. Engine, engine, in, incidentally, any engine that's running too cold is subject to have those same issues. So that's why it's important to have a thermostat and have it run about 210 degrees. Um, what does the term stoichiometric mean? Stoichiometric. You need to be, there's going to be a spelling test in which you're going to have to spell that. I'm going to have that and anti-disestablishmentarianism on the test, and you've got to spell them both right. Okay, so what does the term stoichiometric mean? 14.7 to 1, balanced mixture for cleanest combustion. Now, like I say, sometimes your engine controllers, your really sharp late model ones, may tweak that a little bit one way or another because they, they got, you know, they do stuff, new stuff. Does alcohol, huh? What? 14.7 to 1 what? That's a balanced mixture for the cleanest combustion. Uh, see, if you were going to measure, and you wanted the thing having the cleanest combustion it could possibly make without any emission controls at all, and you could change that mixture and watch it with an exhaust gas analyzer, well, we finally hook up our exhaust gas analyzer, and there may even be a sheet this week on that. Fire up the exhaust gas analyzer, let it get warm, make sure the car is warm, stick that hose in the tailpipe, and you're going to watch those exhaust emissions, and the carbon, carbon dioxide should be high, and all the other gases should be low. And that's basically the 14.7 to 1 is when you tweak it until it's just right. It's running on the ragged edge of being too lean. Well, if you go, now listen to this. Pay attention to what I'm telling you here. Everybody uh, focus on me. If you go richer than 14.7 to 1, you get hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. If you go leaner than 14.7 to 1, you get oxides of nitrogen. Because oxides of nitrogen come from a hot combustion chamber, and a lean mix is hot, and a rich mix is cool. Got me? All right, let's make that happen. Uh, does alcohol produce more power and fuel economy than gasoline? I know it does more power. Uh, no, it does not. It okay. Yeah. Does a com it doesn't. It actually doesn't. It, there's not as much power in alcohol as there is you in need gasoline. A message, hot rod. Yeah. That's why you got. Well, you know, the hot rods are also jetted for it. Let me tell you this. You take an engine, I, and I found this out the hard way. I had some alcohol, denatured alcohol over there, and I was working on a little engine that I wanted to, you know, I didn't have any gas for it. And so, and I knew it was pretty well straightened out. I said, well, let's pour me some of this alcohol in there and let it run off that. And uh, it was running so lean, blah, blah, you know, you know. Now, I don't, you know, I'm not into racing and all that kind of stuff. But if you have, for instance, let, you know, we got this E85. You're not, you don't have, you have a flexible fuel truck. Okay, so he can pull up to the pump where E85 is, and he can fill his truck up with that, that cheap E85 stuff, and it's going to run just fine because his truck is made to run off E85. Well, some yo-yo like me, if I pull up her on my pickup, which don't do the 85, and I say, I'm like, I'm going to sneak some of this in there because it's cheaper than gasoline. Ding, 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 ding. And you squirt it in there. And now all of a sudden, uh, my truck ain't running worth a flip. You know, uh, you know, it won't hardly go. And it's, you know, surging, cutting up, running lean. Check engine light flashing, all that hot uh, But you can take, there's a, there's, a, there's a sheet here that I give out during engine performance where you can check and see how much alcohol is in the gas. And sometimes... You'll have a car like a, a Cadillac or something that would come into the dealership over Randy Wilson was talking about. He said, every time we've got one coming here that's not running right, the first thing we do is we get a fuel sample. We see if it's got, you know, you see if it's got water in it. Sometimes you've got to drain the whole tank. But he said, we get some of that water, I mean that fuel sample, and we check it for alcohol content, and we find like 60%, 70% alcohol. And this, you don't have to do nothing else except get rid of all that alcohol laden gas and pour regular gas in it, and you're good to go. Got me? And, and see, that's smart if you can find bad fuel. Uh, you guys weren't here, but it was a Dodge truck. This guy got a, got gas on a Dodge truck one day. And uh, he said, uh, uh, after I got this gas, after I bought gas, my truck wouldn't run. And so uh, we, you know, went out here. So we pulled it. It had good fuel pressure. Everything looked good. Had fuel injector pulse. The spark plugs weren't sooty or nothing as far as we, you know, they should have started. That's the point. And so... Uh, I got the gas out of it. What I like to do to see if there's water in the gas myself is I like to get me a container that's safe and I'll energize the fuel pump and I'll pump every last bit of the gas that that fuel pump can pump out of that gas tank. They take several containers. But when you've done that, if there's any water in there, you'll see it in the bottom of that in the container. You see that water, you know, because it doesn't mix with the gas. All right, so we pumped some gas out of this one here. You couldn't smell that gas or look at that gas no kind of way and tell that there was anything wrong with it. I couldn't, and I don't think we checked it for alcohol, but it didn't really seem to have alcohol in it. One way or another, all we did to fix that guy's truck was put fresh, clean gas in it, and it took care of it. 
It didn't smell like rotten gas, but whatever he got from that gas station, I figured I've seen diesel fuel, you know, get in a gas, and you can get your gas, your hand wet with a gas and wave it until it dries a little bit, and then if you smell diesel, you know you got diesel in the gas. <laughs> and sometimes people put diesel in there, and it'll make them where they won't run right. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. During a combustion event, why does the ignition spark burn out while energy is still available in the coil? This is what I'm talking about. I have an eraser here. I don't know what I'm using my hand. Okay, we got a spark here. We got a spark. Pow! All right, that's when it jumps the gap. And this right here is while it's burning. All right, you're going to see it kick up a little bit, and then you're going to have leftover energy that's like a rubber band bouncing. All right, this little up kick right here is what's happening right before the spark burns out. And it could have burned longer, but it burned out, and you had this extra energy left over. Now, why does it do that? The reason it does that is because those little droplets of gasoline are acting like conductors, and as long as it's got those in there, it's going to keep burning nice and even. But when it, when it starts to run out of gas, it's going to kick up. And then, it, and then whenever it drops down, it's going to do that. There's not a whole lot, there's not very many guys out there that can explain that to you like that for some reason. I don't know why. But that's what's going on. And one time, when I was at the Volkswagen dealership, uh, and I just first started using a scope, it was in 83, uh, I, the scope was cool as all get out because it was a big sun scope and it was on a, a track that you could move around the shop. <laughs> I mean, hanging from the ceiling. It's really cool. And I rolled that thing over there by my service bay because I had one that was sputtered and popped and cut up. And I said, well, I'll just hook the scope up the ignition system and see what we got. And what I had right here, instead of this pretty little red, when I would give it the gas that was sputtered, I would get this. And it was really wild. And I fooled with that for a little bit because I didn't know a lot about reading the scope, but I kind of knew that if you had a spark plug wire off, the scope would be tall like we showed you guys the other day. That thing had a stopped up fuel filter. That's what was wrong with it. That was a plugged up fuel filter because it was having a horrible time keeping that spark there because it had fuel in there but not enough. You get where I'm going? Well, that's what that looked like. It looked normal idly, but you give it the gas, and more air coming in, this went crazy. All right. Uh, if an engine's running too hot, which harmful gas increases? Knox. Bingo. If it's running too cold, what are you going to get? Hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. Those are mostly the, both the cold, rich running thing. Okay. We'll jump into this other one. Now, guys, these, we got a lot of questions on these tests because these are the advanced courses. Um, and you got to recognize the fact that it's going to take a little bit more time to blow through these stuff. I'm trying to do it as quick as I can while still giving you good theory. But that's one, one of the reasons I do this. Used to, when I would tell everybody to get to have these tests done and come to school on, on the class day, they would come without the test done. And so we're just going over them like this. Um, all overhead valve engines do what? A, use the camshaft close to the valve. B, have the valves located in the head. C, use an overhead camshaft. Or D, operate the true by the true two-stroke cycle. It's actually going to be B. The valves are in the head. However, this is really a stupid question. Uh, except for, if, unless you're talking about Briggs and Stratton or flathead engines, uh, overhead valve, like if, you, if you're making a distinction between two different type of cap, types of camshaft uh, configurations, they'll say overhead valve or overhead cam. Now what's wrong with that distinction? That's how the parts house works. I mean, don't you work at a parts house? Okay, so you say overhead valve or overhead cam. Now the problem I have with that is, even overhead cam engines have still got the valves overhead, you know. I, mean, I would find a different way to do that if it was me. But some of your engines, believe it or not, on a valve cover will say OHV, you know, overhead valve. But, I mean, the camshafts in the block on the ones that they're referring to as overhead valve, even though all the valves are overhead, you know. Now, the old, the Briggs, have you ever pulled a head off a Briggs & Stratton lawnmower engine? Uh, it's just a flat piece of metal with fins on it. You pull it off and you're looking at the top of the piston and the valves. Everything's in the block. Got me? Except on that engine you were fooling with. It's got overhead valves. And that, notice it says OHV on the valve cover. Uh, coolant flow through the radiator is controlled by what? The thermostat. That's not complicated. A normally aspirated automobile engine loses about how much power per 1,000 feet of altitude? Actually, 3%. It's actually 3%, and if you've ever done that, the newer vehicles are made to handle uh, 
I mean, they like, they'll make altitude modifications to the uh, uh, timing and the fuel strategy up to about 4,000 feet. And when you go over about 4,000 feet, you're going to start having issues. Uh, you gotta, if you're going to live up there, like if you're going to move to Denver, you'd have to have your car modified for altitude modifications. It's a manufacturer deal. Uh, on some of the old Jeeps, there was a wire you were supposed to ground and some stuff. On the Jeep uh, um, Cherokees, you had a different crank sensor that actually had advanced the timing. Now, you have to advance the timing when you're at really high altitude, bless you, you've got to have a different air fuel mixture uh, because it takes longer for the burn to happen on those. If somebody accidentally pops an uh, altitude crank sensor on one that's made that not for altitude, it'll ping, labor knock, you know, because it'll be the timing will be too fast. Now, how does that change, how do you have a sensor that changes the timing? If, if you've got your flywheel spinning, you know, this way, uh, then you're basically going to move the sensor a little bit ahead of where it was. See? So it's actually sending out a signal a little sooner. Anytime that you have that sensor in such a way to where it is sending that signal at a different time, it can retard or uh, advance the timing. A lot of people don't think about that. But that engine over there with that little wheel on it, if for some reason somebody didn't tighten up that dadgum uh, bolt, like, and it's one of those like on an Escort you can just pull off of there, and that balancer starts rocking back and forth and it makes that keyway get wider. Uh, you may drive an Escort or a car like that one, and if it's got that, if it's reading off that front wheel, and it'll have no power this time and good power next time, and no power this time and good power next time, and because that balancer is rocking around and it's changing the ignition time and across the board. I've seen that a bunch of times. I've never seen that written in any book, but I've, I've let you run into it. Um, Technician A says a crankshaft determines the stroke of the engine. Technician B says the length of the connecting rod determines the stroke of the engine. Who's right about that? Huh? Crankshaft A. Yeah, the A, the crankshaft, the, the length of the throws on that crankshaft are going to have everything to do with the uh, stroke of an engine, the stroke being how far the piston travels. Technician A says the four strokes of a four cycle uh, or four stroke cycle or intake, compression, power, and exhaust. Is he right? Yes. Technician B says most engines rotate clockwise as viewed from the rear end of the engine. Clockwise from the front. Yeah. yeah, when you're standing looking at the front, unless it's a Honda like this one on the rack out here. Think about it. That Honda, think about which way the engines look. Is The transmission's on the passenger side of the car. The engine's on the driver's side. It turns backwards because the engine's always going to turn the same way the wheels roll, isn't it? Either that or you got to put four reverse gears in the transmission. See where I'm going with that? What's this deer in the headlights look I'm getting from so many people? If the, uh, it ain't just foreign cars because most, for, most of the foreign cars have got the engine the other way. The two exceptions that I can think of off the top of my head are some of your Mitsubishis and some of your Hondas. Not all the Hondas have got it in there the other way. Toyotas don't do that, and neither do Nissans. But if they got the engine in there backwards, they turn the other way. That's why this question says most. Okay. Let me see here. The volume in the cylinder above the piston when the piston is at the bottom of the stroke compared to the volume in the cylinder at the top of the stroke is what? In other words, bottom, you got this much volume. Top, you got this much volume. What you call that? The compression ratio, guys. Compression ratio. The way you describe some of this stuff may be confusing, but the compression ratio is comparing the bottom dead center volume to the top dead center volume. All of these can happen when engine compression is lower than normal, except. Being. What's that? Easier engine cranking. Wait a minute. No, not really. I mean, if you ain't got as much compression, it's going to spin that thing. Cranking does not mean starting, okay? Cranking means. Rah, 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 rah. Listen to this. You get a work order if it's written right and it says, won't crank. I'm going out there to hear one not do anything when I turn the key. You got me? If it says cranks normally but won't start, I'm going to expect one to go wing, 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 wing. You know, starts hard, which means it spins a long time before it starts. So get that straight in your mind there. Sometimes you may have to educate your service writer how to write these things up because sometimes they'll, you know, just put check won't crank, you know. Uh, I think I told you guys one time I, I had this guy said uh, there was these repair lines that you have on your ticket. 
the first repair line, the second repair line, and the third repair line on a warranty ticket. Each one of them had a separate thing you were supposed to repair. One of them might be an engine skip, one of them might be something don't work, whatever. But they're not going to put this more than one repair on the same line. The very first line on that uh, van that he handed me the ticket on says, you have to turn on the left turn signal before the truck will start. And I said, wow, that's interesting. I'm going to tackle that first. And so I dug in there and started pulling around, checking circuits, and I found out somebody had wired it up that way with a dead gum relay. And I went back out there and I said, why? what is the deal on this that you're writing this up? And he says, oh, I just put that up there so you'd know how to start it. <laughs> they did it for anti-theft purposes. They felt like if somebody ever got in there, most people aren't going to think to turn on the left turn signal to start the truck. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. No, I'm going to have to try it. Yeah, but anyway, if he'd, if he'd have put a sticky note on it instead of a repair line, I wouldn't have wasted 30 minutes tracking it down. And you to see? Repair it. Yeah. He was a yo-yo anyway. All right. Let me see. Um, this is like this, the guy, other guy that wrote up a ticket that said, windshield won't separate rain from water. What are you going to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a true write-up. Okay. Yeah, basically number seven is going to be harder to crank the engine, meaning harder to get it to spin over. Uh, that's one reason we use 5W30 oil now, you know, in the, because if it's cold weather, you don't want to have to turn through that molasses. The diameter of a cylinder is called the what? Bore. Uh, just like the diameter of your rifle barrel, right? Technician A says an engine size is called displacement and represents the volume displaced or swept by all the pistons. Technician B says engine power is expressed in horsepower based on the amount of torque or twisting force the engine produces. That's C. That's both A and B. Flip to the next page. Uh, we're making really good time. I'm trying to keep you all from turning into skeletons in here. All right. Uh, which stroke cycle is illustrated in this drawing? You know, which one? What stroke is that? Huh? Okay. How do you know it's exhaust? Very good. See that you had to take you had to think about that. That wasn't as, quite as simple since the turn since the crankshafts are turning clockwise and the piston's going up and that valve's open. If it's going up and there's an open valve, you know it's got to be an exhaust stroke. That was not rocket science, but everybody needs to be able to do that without even thinking about it. How is diesel fuel ignited in a warm diesel engine? Of compression. Yeah, it's the heat of compression. Two two degrees Fahrenheit for every pound of compression. You got a thousand degree air in there and shoot some juice in there. It's going to light off. That's all there is to it. What type of fuel in, uh, diesel injection produces less noise? Indirect injection. IDI. That's basically indirect injection is when your injector. Injection well, I go with the rubber with my hand again. Is whenever the tip of the injector is spraying into a little chamber, you know, that's kind of like opening into the combustion. It seems odd to do this, but you'll have a little chamber in there. And then like when that. The intake I mean, valve opens, it pulls both the fuel and the air in. Yeah, actually, it's spraying it. No, not really. It's spraying it. This is actually a, a hole that's open into the combustion chamber, so it sprays in here, and the, uh, the you know the explosion happens and sort of sprays out there. Basically, you know these diesel engines. Whenever you they wanted to, in order to reduce the noise, a lot of the times what they do is they would start the fire with a very small charge of fuel. Once it starts burning, they put more in there. It's like a double squirt, you know. And uh, they did it on the uh, seven threes with those caterpillar injectors that actually mechanically did that. And then when they went to the six liter, they had these little spool valve driven all you know uh, pressure injectors. And they were trying to do it with that spool valve, and it would cause you know idle surges and stuff because that spool valve couldn't do it as fast as the caterpillar. The, the, the six liter injector was made by Siemens, and so what they did was they would reflash to do away with that uh, you know that second injector squirt. I forget what they call the name of it is. I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, uh, when you did that, the, the gas mileage or the fuel economy on that diesel six liter went from. 20 miles to the gallon down to 13 <laughs> and you couldn't go back the other way you know but those cars were those things were a stud if you got a, if you got one of those six liters when it was crisp and brand new like in a, a f-250 or something one of the diesel guys was you know was talking about how you could get that thing going about uh, 20 miles an hour and if you pop the accelerator to the floor and that variable geometry turbocharger come in it would start that thing burning tires and it would keep spinning them until it got dangerous you doesn't let off 
you know, and that's not usually what you're accustomed to on a diesel, but that variable geometry turbo, and you know Duramax is kind of like that too, you know, and uh, you know, Webb is a, a Chevrolet guy over there. Okay, so I got to give a plug to Duramax every now and then too. Uh, but anyway, um, so here we go, let's see, point fuel, what fuel uh, system component is used in a vehicle equipped with a diesel engine that's not usually used in this, huh? Yeah, that's right. Something else you have are these. What? That's a glow plug. And if you take ground this and put power here, that will be red hot in about two seconds. And uh, then you're supposed to take it to your tongue. You know, so, but basically, that's what that is. A, that is for a six liter. That's a six liter fuel injector. Is what it, or I mean, uh, no, that one there is for a seven three. Uh, now the older 7.3s had a little short injector, the lower ones had it. The 6 liter is pretty cool because you can, these are under the valve cover on the on 7.3, you can take, you can change the injector without pulling the valve cover on 6 liter, uh, which because they got a little, you know, take that harness out. All right, uh, I don't even know where I went there. Um, so water fuel, water separator is what you got on there. Technician A says that diesel engines can be tested using a scan tool to determine a weak or non-functioning cylinder. Technician B says glow plugs can be used to help start a cold diesel engine, prevent excessive white smoke during warm-up. Yeah, that's C, basically. Uh, white smoke can also be the result of a, they got manifold heaters, too, that warm the air up, you know, when you're going in there. And the, they, the manifold heater, on a, it's like a cigarette lighter coil, except it's a bigger thing down in there, and it pulls about 50 amps. And on the uh, power stroke, it only works during the first 90 seconds after startup. But on the Duramax, it's got the same heater, but it may use it any time it wants to. So it's a different strategy. You know, you got to think about how that stuff works too. Um, what color exhaust smoke often occurs during cold engine starts because smoke usually condensed fuel droplets? White. Well, that's number 15. That's going to be white. Uh, the use of a variable vein turbocharger allows the elimination of what? Ooh, that's a complicated question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Turbocharger yeah. wastegate. What the wastegate does to keep you from overboosting is it's going to let some of the exhaust gas go around that turbine wheel, right? Well, on the variable vein turbocharger, it actually has little um, veins that close up and keep the air from going through there so fast, and it can control the speed of the turbocharger that way. Believe it or not, when those veins are closed up, the turbocharger spins faster. When they're open, it spins slower. Think about putting your uh, thumb over the a water hose. The water comes out faster, don't it? take the thumb, the thumb off and it goes out slower. And that's kind of what that is. When those veins close down, it's going to spin that thing quicker and all that. Uh, so the most common diesel exhaust emission test used in local testing programs is what? That's the opacity test. They're going to basically look and see how much is coming through here. You get one of those uh, uh, the Duramax or the uh, those common rail uh, power stroke engines, uh, you can get back there. I'm not kidding you, y'all. You can go back there with a white glove and go to the inside of that exhaust pipe and drag it on there, and you won't get nothing on that white glove. That's how clean that thing is. Wow. I mean, they are crystal clear. They clean the air while they're driving through somewhere like Los Angeles. <laughs> you know, they genuinely do. I mean, the air coming out is cleaner than the air that was going in. So how come whenever they romp on it, there's tons of black smoke that pours out of it? Which ones? Uh... The other day I was coming back from school, going home, and a big Dodge diesel comes yeah. flying by me, and I'm going 80, 90. Yeah. And this thing just romps on and zooms by me on the double lane. So you were going 80 or 90, and he blew you away? I wasn't even trying to yeah. race. It All depends on what he's done to it. Some these guys, these a lot of these people, even though they've got a, a diesel engine that runs better than diesel ever have, they still want to try to make it run better, and so they'll put a chip in it. You see where I'm going? They don't always do that. You know, they're not supposed to. If they put, if they've chipped it, they're typically going to get black smoke out of it. But if they haven't chipped it, if they've left it alone, it will run clean. That's what that's what it's all set up for. Okay, uh, what number am I on? Eighteen. What percent of opacity means the exhaust has no visible smoke and does not block light from a beam projected through the exhaust smoke? That's a zero. What percentage of opacity means the exhaust is so dark it completely blocks light from a beam projected through the smoke? That's 100%. Number 20, a diesel-powered vehicle. Uh, a diesel-powered vehicle with a manual transmission is rapidly accelerated in low gear from an idle speed to a maximum governed RPM while the smoke emissions are measured. 
Which of these diesel smoke opacity tests is being performed? Number 20, a rolling acceleration test. That's what that is. And that's typically how you do that on a diesel. Yeah. Which of these takes place during regeneration in a diesel particulate filter? Regeneration. Yes, you're getting a new engine out of the deal, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, actually, that's going to be your, you're getting rid of the soot. A particulate filter keeps anything from coming out of that pipe at all. That's one of the reasons it's so clean back there. Uh, as far as when I say anything, any particle, it's going to have only air, only gas coming out of there. And the carbon dioxide at that. And they have EGR on those diesels. Incidentally, let me tell you this. If you apply, if you've got a scan tool and you can turn EGR on on a diesel, it doesn't make it idle rough, it makes it run quiet. You know, and the diesel will be sitting there going blah, 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 like that. And then when you, you start driving EGR in there, and it gets real quiet. It's still running, but it's just quiet. Well, you're probably going to wind up making a lot of knocks and everything. and It's not good to do that. There's all kinds of hardware on that dadgum thing, you know, for the EGR, though. And it's something that they're making. They're getting kind of stringent on that. So, um, let's see. Uh, Technician A says a diesel engine uses the heat of compression to ignite the diesel fuel. Technician B says direct injection uses a pre-combustion chamber. Who's right about that? That's A only. That's a only. Yeah. Direct injection is squirting it right in there. And incidentally, I was telling Daniel a little bit about direct injection gasoline engines. Now, they've been out there for several years now. Hyundai's got some of them. You know, GDI is what they call it. You know, the, or I mean, that's what the industry calls it gasoline direct injection. And it runs really high fuel pressure, like, you know, uh, from 800 to 4,000 pounds of pressure or something like that. Oh, it's squirting it right in there. And it can control when it goes in as well as how much. Is it more efficient? The engines are smaller, but they're more powerful. It's really interesting how that works. All right, so let me see here. I mean, you'll, have, you'll see a doggone big old uh, trailblazer-sized uh, vehicle with a 1.6-liter engine in it of gasoline direct injection. I mean, that's really something how they go smaller with the engines and get more power out of them. Um, let's see. What part should be removed to test cylinder compression on a diesel engine? Glow plug. Yeah, you typically are going to pull the glow plug out on those. Um, you can pull the injector, though, so glow plug or injector is the right one. It's going to be a B. Uh, what diesel system uses to supplies high pressure fuel to all the injectors at one time? Um, common rail. High pressure common rail. And number 25, the diesel injection pump is usually driven by what? Gear. A gear off the camshaft. Uh, however, I will tell you that the uh, this little diesel uh, Volkswagen that Bobby's bringing in for an oil change, the injector pump on that one is pulled by the timing belt. A lot of those little small four-cylinder diesel engines are pulled off the timing belt. I mean, the injector pumps are. Uh, all right, we got through in a really...